Monsieur Binance. Thank you. <laughs> so shall we shall we wait or uh, shall I start? Ah. Uh, <laughs> or we can uh, wait for uh, two, three minutes. Three minutes? <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. So maybe now is the time to, to, to start, I think. People are still coming. I think uh, it's okay uh, for you. Okay. For your tool. Okay. So this uh, this work is a collaboration. It's mostly numerical, but contains some elements of theory as well. And so it's a collaboration between um, uh, people who created uh, with people who created some new numerical methods uh, for compressible turbulence. Uh, these are higher order methods. Um, uh, which deliver um, special like quality for compressible flows. And, and also uh, Grisha Falkovich is involved uh, as a theorist in this uh, uh, work. Uh, my plan is uh, very simple. So I would like to start with an astrophysical motivation for this study, and then I will uh, talk, give some background information about two-dimensional turbulence in general. Uh, then I will talk about simulations of compressible in turbulence in 2D. And then I will discuss results which uh, mostly are related to scaling at large and small scales, and uh, energy spectra and cascades in this case. And so the picture in compressible uh, turbulence is uh, substantially more uh, rich than in the incompressible 2D. And so I think it, it should be interesting uh, for this audience. Um, the astrophysical part comes from disk-like galaxies, which are uh, quasi-two-dimensional systems. And so there is a stellar component in uh, this disk-like galaxy, and also there is an interstellar medium. And so this medium is turbulent because Reynolds numbers are very high um, there. And this turbulence is anisotropic. It's actually quasi-two-dimensional turbulence. When we observe a uh, disk-like galaxy face-on like this, 
uh, we can measure uh, power spectra of uh, column density of the gas in the galaxy. And what was noticed some time ago is that there is a break in this spectrum. Uh, it is uh, shallower on large scales, and then it is uh, getting steeper on small scales. And the point of break here roughly coincides with the thickness of the gas uh, in the disk. So uh, it was interpreted, the idea was that it could be uh, something which we don't really know what it is, but it could be also a transition from uh, quasi two-dimensional to three-dimensional turbulence in galactic disks. And so this object is a large Magellanic cloud, is a, a satellite of uh, the Milky Way, and so um, because it's uh, proximity, we, we know the the specs are pretty well, and so this is one of the best cases studied, but there are, there are more cases like this. And uh, in astrophysics, uh, this idea translated into measuring the thickness of the gaseous disk uh, using this uh, uh, break point in the power spectrum. Okay, when we, uh, we can check these ideas using numerical simulations, and so this is, uh, um, a fragment, a piece, a sub uh, volume from a numerical simulation, which show, shows a galaxy which is similar to a large Magellanic cloud. And so, if you, if you measure this uh, spectrum of column density, uh, it also shows a break, uh, and it breaks from minus uh, three to roughly minus two. And the break point is again roughly the thickness of the disk. You can also look at the uh, velocity power spectra for different components of velocity, um, and you will see that uh, turbulence is an isotropic. Most of the motion happens in the plane of the disk, while in the perpendicular direction, uh, the velocities are much smaller. Okay. So this uh, compressible two-dimensional turbulence uh, is also of interest for different other applications beyond astrophysics. And so the, the closest one would be the flowing soap films, where, um, which uh, are described by, uh, in some limit, uh, I will not go into details here, but in some limit uh, they can be described by, exact, by, by exactly the same set of equations that we are solving. Um, it also has to do with uh, uh, fluid layers, uh, geostrophic turbulence, uh, and granular media, and zonal flows. So let me just start with a very simple background uh, information about uh, differences between 3D and 2D turbulence. So in three dimensions, uh, this important term, which is vortex stretching, is not zero, and that helps to uh, dissipate energy at small scales and uh, direct the cascade from large to small scales. So if you have in 3D uh, an injection scale at large scales, then the energy uh, will cascade down to smaller scales and dissipate in small scales. In 2D, the, the situation is different, so this term is exactly zero, and that blocks the flux of energy to small scales and what we have instead, uh, we have two cascades. So this uh, uh, graph shows a sketch of a power spectrum of energy. And, and so if we inject energy at some injection scale, Ki, and then uh, energy will go to large scales. And it is expected that the spectrum will have a slope of 5 thirds, as predicted by Greichmann. And uh, there will be a secondary cascade of uh, anstrophy to small scales, and the energy spectrum in that range uh, is uh, k to the minus 3. Uh, basically, uh, what one can say is that uh, numerical simulations uh, confirm uh, roughly this picture. There are some open questions left, but uh, overall, uh, <clears throat> It has been demonstrated that indeed the anstrophy cascade uh, 
uh, goes uh, forms the spectrum with uh, logarithmic corrections. Correction k to the minus three as predicted by Kreichner 69 and then uh, 67, sorry, uh, and then uh, in, in 71, he added this logarithmic correction to keep the uh, flux of entropy constant. And so this uh, work by Xie Chen in 2003 and collaborators showed that uh, indeed the flux is perfectly uh, flat, right, in a wide range of scales. The simulation is not really very high resolution by today's standards, so it's, it's 2,040 squared. But this group was using hyperviscosity so that this part is very steeply uh, falling down. And uh, they were able to really get a very nice result for the, for the constant flux. Uh, the spectrum scales like k to the minus 3 with logarithmic correction, but there are so many orders of magnitude here that you cannot really guess uh, about the quality of this um, uh, spectrum. As far as the inverse cascade goes, um, uh, the uh, Kalmogorov slope was also reproduced in numerical simulations by different groups. So this is just one example. So you see that the spectrum here uh, is roughly k to the minus 5 thirds. That's the compensated spectrum shown here. And then the flux is not really very flat in a wide range of uh, scales, but, but it, it goes in the right direction at least and, and has some, some short flat uh, part. The fact that the, it does not extend to larger scales is uh, probably due to the linear friction that is uh, needed to stabilize, to get to the steady state in, um, in the incompressible case in 2D. Otherwise, the, the energy will accumulate at large scales and the system will blow up. <coughs> uh, finally, uh, uh, there were simulations that were able to resolve both direct cascade of entropy and, uh, and inverse cascade of uh, kinetic energy in the incompressible case. And so this is a kind of a dual cascade picture um, that we have seen in the in a few slides before. So that, that here we have the injection scale and then uh, you inject kinetic energy and, uh, enst uh, and, and entropy and uh, kinetic energy uh, cascades to larger scales, entropy cascades to smaller scales. The, the predictions of uh, Kolmogorov and Kreichnan are roughly um, reproduced here um, with a series of simulations that show numerical convergence. So this, uh, the highest resolution case is uh, 32,000 squared, and this is the red line here. Uh, this simulation has not evolved for a very long time, so this part of the spectrum is still uh, evolving, developing, and you see kind of a bottleneck here, I think. So it's not clear whether we see a k to the minus 5 thirds, um, but, but the spectrum here is also a little bit steeper than k to the minus 3, which is uh, uh, normal. Okay, and, and the... the uh, the spectral, the spectral fluxes, so for the kinetic energy here, we, we see a very flat, nice uh, spectral flux, and the same goes for, for the entropy. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, let me now switch to what we have done. So we were solving uh, this system of equations numerically, and so this uh, corresponds to um, uh, and either thermal equation of state, which is uh, often used in, used in astrophysics because in the interstellar medium we have radiative processes that uh, help to keep the gas at constant temperature due to energy losses. Okay, so it's a little bit unusual for the fluid, fluid dynamics community that we are using this simple uh, um, um, either thermal equation of state. Okay, but otherwise we don't have to use the large-scale large friction in this case because uh, compressibility takes care of the uh, energy growth, and you will see this in a moment. Um, 
uh, we, we have uh, usual uh, dimensionless parameters like the Reynolds number here and, and the Mach number for the compressible flow. Um, um, uh, these two equations, there is no energy equation if you assume isothermality, but you can use these two equations to derive the, uh, the energy balance equation for, uh, for the system. And so you have usual uh, terms on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side you have viscous dissipation, and you have forcing, okay? Uh, now, the total energy in this case is an ideal invariant. You can drop these red terms and green terms, and so that will be an ideal Euler system with uh, uh, an either thermal equation of state. And, and, and what is conserved is uh, by the um, Euler system is uh, the sum of the kinetic energy and uh, uh, potential energy of compression. It, it, there is no established terminology in this case uh, for how do we call this uh, little e here, which is actually in, in the other thermal case is a logarithm of density. <clears throat> so we, uh, it's convenient for this problem to call it a, a compressive energy, uh, potential energy of compression. Okay, you can also split the, the uh, total energy balance equation into two balance equations for the kinetic energy and for the potential energy separately. And so there you see the exchange terms, the pressure dilatation term, which uh, enters with a plus here and with a minus here, they cancel out each other. So forcing goes into the, uh, directly into the kinetic energy balance uh, and, and viscous dissipation dissipates kinetic energy only. So the, this total energy is conserved, but only for smooth solutions, because if you, as soon as you get other thermal shocks, uh, energy is not conserved in, in other thermal shocks. And uh, uh, this is similar to what happens in one-dimensional Burgess system, okay? <clears throat> so, uh, so in the, the, the either thermal Navier-Stokes system that we are dealing with is actually a dissipative system, and so the time derivative of the total energy um, say in the periodic box, uh, would be equal to the forcing, uh, the energy input, minus viscous dissipation uh, here. Okay. Uh, so there is a, a number of uh, cases computed at different resolutions. So what you want to see here is that the, the grid resolutions that we have uh, go up to 16,000 squared. And we vary basically the energy injection scale, the energy injection rate, and, um, and we keep the box size always uh, unity, right? Uh, <clears throat> so the, the series of uh, A, B, C, D models, basically uh, in this uh, series of models, uh, the extent of uh, direct uh, anstrophy cascade and the extent uh, of the inverse energy cascade a double uh, when we transit from A to B to, to C to D. Now the stars mean that uh, there are two different numerical methods used here. Uh, one is the classical piecewise parabolic method de designed for uh, uh, flows with strong shocks. Uh, this is a three, uh, third order of volume um, it's a higher order Godunov method, um, and it's uh, it's. Um, uh, but the the second one is uh, um, higher order um, uh, finite difference scheme. The PPM is a finite volume method. So this finite um, difference scheme um, has basic order of eight. And uh, it reduces uh, this order at shocks to, to the seventh order. But in a very economical way, so that, that, that makes it a very um, accurate method, uh, which uh, has a much better um, bandwidth than PPM. So this 
this models uh, B star and D star, uh, the highest resolution model uh, here is using this uh, new recently developed uh, uh, high order uh, scheme uh, that is uh, uh, similar to, to spectral uh, methods in the incompressible case. Okay, so what we see, if we, first we would like to look at the energy evolution as a function of time, and we normalize the time by the forcing time here. Uh, lambda f is the forcing scale, uh, epsilon f is uh, 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 energy injection rate. So what we see is that basically all uh, cases uh, shows initial energy growth, which then saturates due to basically uh, energy loss, mostly in shocks, okay? And the saturation happens at uh, Mach numbers close somewhere in between 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So that's, that's roughly uh, the, and, and uh, we never get uh, higher Mach numbers in, in these models. So now we can uh, look at uh, one of the cases in more detail. Uh, so this is uh, case C. Uh, uh, it has a grid resolution of 8,000 squared. So what we see here is that initially, um, for the first roughly 50 uh, uh, large eddy turnover time in the periodic box, the, the energy growth is linear and it goes as uh, roughly 92% of the energy injection rate. And so that is mostly basically uh, incompressible regime. But then uh, it, it departs from this uh, regime as soon as first chocolates form and the slope switches to 35% of the injection rate. This is a typical slope that you can trace here, okay? Um, now this, uh, this line shows the total energy and the, the green line shows the kinetic energy. The difference between the two is the, the potential energy of compression. So this potential energy is re really small, it's uh, on the level of 10%, but it plays an important role in, in the dynamics of the cascades here. Uh, the red line shows uh, the um, Entropy is a function of time, and so you see that entropy is uh, roughly constant as expected, and as, as is the case in, uh, in the incompressible models. Uh, this uh, shaded areas will uh, correspond to the spectra I will show later. So they were averaged over this uh, time intervals here, there, and there. So this is early evolution. Uh, this is uh, uh, the uh, stage before energy condensation happens in this model, and that is the case with energy condensate present. Okay. So the density uh, fluctuations are small. They basically are at the level of 25%, uh, and so, um, or maybe even smaller, to like 20%. And so first they, they follow the Mach squared pretty tightly, and then they depart when things get nonlinear. Um, there are different ways to visualize this uh, turbulence, but so um, here I'm using a, um, uh, a method developed uh, by Cabral and collaborators at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in the early 90s, uh, so uh, this texture shows the, the uh, flow lines um, and then the color shows the density. So you see vortices here and there. So these are uh, density minima associated with uh, large uh, coherent vortices in this case. And uh, this is a higher, higher density region uh, between the vortices. Okay. And so what the evolution in this case C uh, goes uh, through a uh, usual process of merging uh, vortices and uh, forming uh, condensate vortices, as you see in this uh, 
uh, last uh, picture. So these are, uh, this is a vortex dipole representing energy condensate in this uh, compressible case. So what you see is that uh, it's normal vorticity as uh, the same as in the incompressible case, but on top of that you see shocks connecting the, the, two, the, the vortex dipole, essentially, right? And they, they go in different directions, and they dissipate energy. <clears throat> okay, so let me, uh, let me show you a short movie. Uh, so the, the, the first snapshot that you see basically shows the forcing. Then uh, here, this is vorticity uh, as it evolves. Uh, and so you see um, a standard picture uh, similar to the incompressible case. And so as the system, I will scroll because the movie is very long. Uh, so here at this stage, you have vortex dipole. Uh, uh, and then uh, later, uh, what, what happens is that this uh, mean flow becomes stronger and it, it clears up all the smaller vortices, leaving just the, the dipole. Uh, okay, no coherent vortices uh, left uh, at this stage. Okay, so this is uh, what is interesting here uh, because that's density. It starts from noise uh, and then from this noise, <coughs> you start seeing um, <clears throat> larger um, coherent vortices forming here, right? Uh, so this red strawberries are vortices, and then they merge, um, and there is a lot of acoustic noise. Uh, uh, let's scroll down. Uh, so that is condensate. You see a lot of shocks, acoustic waves, um, and so this presence of waves in the compressible case changes the system qualitatively in, in a, a serious way because um, um, vortices become unstable uh, and start radiating acoustic waves. And uh, this um, changes the dynamics of the system with respect to the incompressible case. So that is, again, a rendering of the same uh, flow at the end of the simulation, um, so this is case B star with a different numerical method. So you see the same structure. Uh, you see a large scale vortex dipole and strong shock connecting the two vortices. And, and there is more shocks here and there. OK, so if you look at the spectra, uh, and I, I, I'm starting with just very simple uh, spectra of primitive variables. So I'm talking about the velocity spectrum on the left and density spectrum on the right. So uh, this is the injection scale, and you see that uh, this part scales like Kolmogorov, right? While this part is steeper, it has a slope of uh, 2.3, I think, uh, maybe 2.5. Okay. And so this is a compensated spectrum. Uh, this part is flat because it's compensated with k to the minus 5 thirds. And so you might think that this means that uh, uh, the, the, the cascade is known to be not uh, really very local. And so uh, you, you might think that, yes, there is a, a piece of Kolmogorov spectrum on larger scales here while the, the scales closer to the energy injection rate are con contaminated by the forcing. But if you look at the uh, uh, flux of kinetic energy averaged of this, uh, over the same time interval, you see that uh, this part is flat. That's where you see k to the minus 2. And this part is not really uh, settled. Uh, and so. That means there is no Kolmogorov uh, cascade uh, or, or Kreichnan cascade in this case. It's not the cascade that is responsible for the uh, scaling of five thirds. <clears throat> I will skip this, uh, I think. Uh, so we can switch to the next stage where uh, we have well-developed turbulence in the box, uh, but we, we don't have condensate yet. 
And so the scaling here is k to the minus 2 all the way from the forcing scale to the box size. And it's a very nice, if you plot it compensated, it's, it's a very nice uh, spectrum. Um, so there is a nearly a two orders of magnitude of uh, flat spectrum here. Now density also follows some scaling, uh, unlike at the early stage where it's pretty messy. Here, uh, the scaling of the density spectrum is uh, k to the minus uh, seven thirds on large scales. Uh, this model is, was computed with PPM, so it does not really um, um, uh, give a precise measurement of the uh, small scales. As the condensate gets developed, it uh, distorts the spectra at large scales, and you see that the density spectrum gets this deep, and then the same happens basically uh, with the velocity spectrum, and you get k to the minus 3 at, at large scales, which is expected for the systems where condensation happens. Okay, so if we, if we instead do very uh, strong pumping, there is no condensate form. And, uh, for, uh, instead, we get uh, clusters of vortices and so that, that is a difference. Uh, so with strong pumping, we get more strong shocks and condensate cannot form because uh, the, the, the large scale vortex the dipole would be unstable uh, at this Mach number. <coughs> so the density field in this case looks pretty messy. So you see a combination of vortices and very strong uh, wave activity in this case. So the spectra for the strong pumping case uh, show k to the minus 2 scaling for both velocity and density. Uh, so this, uh, the blue uh, spectrum is velocity. Uh, the red spectrum is density. And you see that large scales where the cascade is uh, unable to go because the Mach number is too high, the energy gets dissipated. Uh, so the density spectrum switches to roughly uh, k to the minus three halves, I think, so it gets shallower. And the same happens to the velocity. <clears throat> okay, so if we... Uh, so if we, if we decompose the velocity spectrum using standard Helmholtz decomposition, we see that basically there are, there are two independent cascades here on small scales. So one is the standard uh, estrophy cascade, and it is described by the solenoidal component of the velocity, of course. And the second is uh, <coughs> basically kadamsev petviashvili a direct um, acoustic energy cascade. So that is the signature. And they have the right slopes, as predicted by theory. So for example, here uh, we see spectra of potential energy, of density, and of uh, dilatational component of the velocity. They lie on top of each other. And this is due to uh, equipartition of acoustic and uh, potential energy in, in this <coughs> in, in this case. Uh, dilatational kinetic energy, okay. Uh, most of the simulations are done in the uh, implicit large eddy uh, mode uh, without explicit viscosity, but we've done a series of uh, uh, small uh, runs uh, that include the viscosity, and we see that here as we uh, get the Reynolds number higher, we, the spectra uh, <clears throat> below the energy injection rate converge pretty nicely to the uh, implicit large AD uh, case. I need to wrap up, okay. Okay, so, um, okay, so let me, let me just put up the summary. Um, and so in this case, so, um, 
What I would like to say uh, to conclude here is that in, in, in this two-dimensional uh, turbulence, uh, compressible turbulence, we have a flux loop. Uh, kinetic energy tends to go uh, to large scales as uh, uh, in the incompressible case. But due to acoustic vortex instability, some of this energy gets converted into the energy of uh, acoustic waves. And these acoustic waves cascade the energy down to smaller scales. Okay, thank you.